serve as a judge in Alameda County in Oakland across the Bay Bridge. I'm also a member of the American Bar Association Commission on Homelessness and Poverty, which is a co-sponsor of this event. I also have served in the past uh, on num numerous committees with the California Administrative Office of the Courts dealing with homelessness and access and fairness. So I drew the short straw and I'm uh, giving you the welcome remarks. Uh, we're very, very happy to see you. I do need to start off with this because I think it's important. Most of the conferences that I attend, someone at the host city is always talking about the weather, which I really never really care about. I, I don't think that's a... <laughs> But I'm going to talk about the weather today because I took BART over. I took public transportation. And when I got off BART, I noticed as I was walking down the hallway in BART, the entire left side of the hallway had people who were houseless, homeless, uh, sleeping in sleeping bags. They had their carts there. The entire left side of the hallway at BART. So welcome to the ending the criminalization of homelessness, the role of courts, lawyers, and advocates. Um, there are just a couple of things we're going to say. I apologized earlier for us starting a little late. Some people thought this started at 9 o'clock. And we will make up our time probably during the lunch break. Um, about two years ago, the American Bar Association on Com Commission on Homelessness and Poverty and the Administrative Office of the Courts uh, had a, a one-day conference here on collaborative justice and courts and homelessness. And some of the people were so positive about that conference that they said we ought to do it annually. Some of us who planned that conference said there is no way that that's going to happen annually. But uh, Stephen Binder, who's a public defender in San Diego, who many consider to kind of be the godfather of uh, homeless courts, uh, got together with some people uh, from the AOC uh, a few months ago, and they decided that this would be an opportune time to hold a one-day session that we're holding today. Uh, Stephen, unfortunately, and I want you to feel very sorry for him, Stephen is on a cruise in the Mediterranean right now. <laughs> so Stephen p helped plan this event, but he couldn't attend. Uh, but I had to give Stephen a plug. Uh, we intend for today's sessions to be interactive. The, though we have excellent people sitting on all of our panels who have a wealth of information, we want to create dialogue with all of the attendees here. So there will always be an opportunity to ask questions and to also give some of the uh, uh, panelists your own information. There will be opportunities all through the day for us to do that. Um, uh, we, uh, we, want, we want you to actively participate, and I think people who are concerned about these types of issues are not wallflowers. I think many of you have opinions and thoughts, and we want you to share them with us. We always learn something new at these kinds of events. Um, let me, first of all, and I, because I want to take care of this, there are a number of people who assisted in planning this event. And if you are here, I'd like you to stand, and for those of you who wish to acknowledge them, I'd like you to hold your applause until, the, until I'm through introducing these individuals. And I'd like you to remain standing if you can. Uh, from the Administrative Office of the Courts, Diane Nunn, Nancy Taylor, Carrie Zoller, uh, Karen Moen, Yolanda Leung, Irene Balahadia, Marita uh, Desuacido, Sharina Zalzos, and Michael Roosevelt. And from the ABA, Amy Horton Newell. Amy is really the ABA staff person who, uh, who plans all of this stuff. Uh, Paul Fries, uh, Renato Esquieta, and Jeremy Rosen. And from the Center for Court Innovation, Julius Lang. And uh, these are the people who really planned this event, so I'd like you to acknowledge them right now. Housekeeping. You can see from the schedule that we have three morning panels, two afternoon panels, plus a case study this afternoon at, at, and at lunch. For those of you who think you're just going to relax and eat your lunch and not uh, uh, converse with everyone else, we have three breakout lunch sessions. And you can choose to go to whichever one you wish to go to. They are alternatives to the criminalization of homelessness, Homeless Courts, Veterans Treatment Courts, and Specialty Courts, and Homeless Families and Youth. So at the lunch break, uh, we'll be able to uh, divide into breakout sessions and continue our discussions. 
Um, everyone should have this blue folder, and it is extremely important. Uh, it has, of course, the agenda, but it also has on your agenda the website, the American Bar Association website, where you can get all the materials that we're going to refer to today. Uh, so please uh, don't, don't discard that, and please go on the website. Uh, it, it's very well done and very, very informative. Um, I had a prop here, and now I've lost it, but the United States Homeless, the report that came out a couple of weeks ago. Thank you, Kathy. The United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, coincidentally, two weeks ago, came out with a, uh, a very informative document on eradicating homelessness. So I think that's in our uh, materials, but I, I, I want to suggest that you should check that out. Um, now, uh, Karen, you've got a couple of housekeeping matters. Karen Moen has a couple of housekeeping matters, and then we will have our first panel, uh, which is moderated by Paul Fries. Good morning, and again, we would like to welcome you to the uh, to San Francisco today on this somewhat rainy day. Uh, and you will find a lot of people in our neighborhood sleeping in the uh, doorways and in the BART and wherever they can find shelter today. Um, for those of you that are interested in MCLE credit, we need to have you sign in and also there will be a form out there for your own records. For those of you who are judges and court staff, uh, California judges and court staff, we have a personal record of attendance sheet out there um, for you to use in your own courts when you're applying for um, con uh, continuing education credit through your courts. Um, so you can pick those up out at the registration desk. And again, it's important if you're seeking MCLE credit that you um, sign in. Um, unfortunately, there's no food or drink in, in the conference center here. Um, we apologize for that, but it's the rules <laughs> for all of us. And uh, you'll probably grumble throughout the morning as much as we who are our staff do when we have to come to meetings here. Um, for lunch, the breakouts will be in the following rooms. In the San Diego room, which will be over on this side, uh, it'll be the alternatives to criminalization of the, the homelessness or of the homeless. And you'll pick up your lunch. It's really meant to be a time to be a networking experience. In the Monterey Room, which is over here, it'll be the homeless, veterans, and other specialty courts. And in Santa Barbara, which is also over here, homeless uh, families, children, um, homeless families, and youth. So during lunch, you get to choose your topic, and there'll be people there to help um, stimulate the conversations and so forth. But we hope you enjoy your day and uh, enjoy your more informal conversations over lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Fries. I'm with the law firm Public Counsel in Los Angeles. We're the nation's largest provider of pro bono legal services. I'm just curious, has any of you never heard of public counsel before? Oh, that's great. <laughs> I have to share a funny story. I, I was uh, doing a training at the VA uh, to evoke rehab specialists, and I was so impassioned about the topic, I introduced public counsel, but I forgot to mention my name. <laughs> and at the end of the training, uh, this guy came over and shuffled over and said, uh, does Paul Fries still work at public counsel? <laughs> 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 Apparently I haven't aged that gracefully. <laughs> Anyway, I feel like I've died and gone to heaven. My colleague, uh, Lucy Fitzpatrick, is here today, Lucy, who's uh, embedded in Skid Row working with uh, both homeless veterans and mentally ill homeless and trying to help incorporate legal services and make them accessible uh, where the need is most acute. In framing the issue today, I'm just so excited to have so many friends from the ABA and the AOC here and, and especially to commend and salute the VA for their leadership at a time when homelessness has never been looking more grim or dire. Um, I was at a meeting of the United Way just a few weeks ago where they're announcing their efforts to end chronic homelessness and a full-blown assault through permanent supportive housing models and housing first models. And the only group that had shrunk in terms of their chronic homelessness was the VA with veterans. Uh, they, they were able to succeed in reducing homelessness by a full thousand in Los Angeles alone. Um, nationally, statistics are a reduction of 17%. Um, while chronic homelessness in L.A. rose by 2,000 last year, despite this frontal assault that we've been trying to marshal. 
Uh, and that's a testament to leadership of the VA and changing the way of doing business to engage the community uh, more effectively and dynamically to attack this issue and, and really try to end homelessness, not simply manage it. Uh, and in terms of what we hope to achieve through this conference, I, I think very simply in terms of trying to humanize a very complex problem. And I, I think that more that we see the human being behind the person, as, as Judge Branco mentioned, is sleeping in, in, a, in, a, in, in the rain, um, and see them as our, our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, our children, um, <clears throat> the more hope there will be ultimately in the long run. Um, I, I think my own children in, in uh, terms of some of the experience they've had with the homeless and uh, driving with my son David one day and I said, David, look, there's a homeless woman. He said, oh, daddy, we must help her. Um, that instinct of wanting to reach out and never give up on the most poor in our midst, I think, is the most powerful one that we have to keep alive. I'll never forget seeing my first homeless person back in 1980. And I was staggered in New York City to see a woman with uh, her feet exposed and pus and, and I think they called elephantitis or just swollen beyond belief and slumped with all of her worldly belongings while people just walked by as if she didn't exist. And I thought, how has this happened in our society? And <clears throat> I think the first step in ending homelessness is for looking at the human being, engaging them, seeing them, and not treating them as invisible. And and all of us are, are committed to that process, and all of us must join force that process for it to ever have, have hope. Um, I have been particularly fortunate to be involved in the ABA, thanks to Amy Horton Newell, Steve Binder, uh, and other leaders for the last seven years, and, and that involvement gives me hope. Um, all of us have seen success in individual cases of trying to help reduce or end homelessness in clients we've taken on. But in terms of the global issue and seeing it get uh, gradually worse and seeing society turn a hardened heart towards it more and more out of frustration, we need to have umbrella groups like the ABA, a vehicle to have a center of gravity to marshal resources to really join force and make that, that collective impact that we cannot do or achieve on our own individually. Um, I've been pleased to serve in the ABA in, in a dual capacity as Special Advisor on Veterans Advocacy to the Commission on Homeless and Poverty. This is an amazing group of dynamic leaders across the country. Uh, Gordon, Steve, Jeremy, uh, Amy are all involved with it. Um, Renato, who will be speaking later. And also serve as the co-chair on the Veterans, uh, excuse me, the VA's, the ABA Commission on, forgive me, what is it called? The Coordinating Committee on Veterans Benefits and Services, forgive me. <laughs> and I also had the pleasure of serving as co-chair on the Governor's Interagency uh, Council on Veterans with the Veteran Justice Working Group. And in that capacity, I've met a number of dear people here, uh, Suzanne, Janice from the VA, uh, among many others, uh, too numerous to name. Um, so in terms of what we hope to achieve, I, I do want to focus on framing the issue to show what's at stake. And I think back on what we saw happen with the Vietnam era when we did not fully understand the invisible wounds of war and how that would ultimately drive homelessness and helplessness. And the profile was, I'm, I'm a veteran myself. I, I served in 1973 to 76. I did not serve in combat. But I saw what combat did to the men and women who served alongside of me and the wreckage of their lives was often the result. Uh, the pattern we saw was the wounded warrior comes home, the invisible wounds of PTS, we did not have a diagnosis for it until 1978, or traumatic brain injury, with a culture of denial. I, I was in basic training in AIT in Fort Gordon, Georgia, came down with walking pneumonia and did not want to go to sick bay because of the stigma associated with that. Tried to sleep it off, woke up on a Monday morning and I could barely walk. And I mentioned to a Marine buddy of mine, you know, I've, I've just got to go into sick bay, I can barely walk. And he kind of scoffed and said, ah, you wuss. The doctor said if I hadn't gotten in that day, I would have died in three days. I had one lung entirely filled with phlegm and the other one was quickly filling up. I would have literally have drowned. Well, that's a stigma for physical ailments. Can you imagine how much more for mental ailments? So the wounded warrior comes home with those afflictions of depression, nightmarish, uh, nightmares, uh, flashbacks, anxiety disorders, survivor's guilt. In order to deal with that, begins to self-medicate and ultimately in ways to get them in trouble with the law. Now they have a criminal record. Now it impacts their ability to either get or keep work. Now that imposes economic distress and fissures in the family unit, often leading to the breakup of the family, causing trauma for the children. Um, further depression, suicidal ideation, longer stints of unemployment, leading ultimately towards homelessness and living in and out of jail on and off the streets. The profile I just described during the Vietnam era took about six years to materialize itself in homelessness. 
We're now seeing that same profile for this generation of combat veterans materialize in homelessness in six to nine months. Um, and to put it, 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 a number on what's at stake, we estimate that as I speak, there are 233,000 veterans in our jails and prisons um, who are mostly from the Vietnam era men, 58 years old and older. And think about that. They're chronically unemployable. Most have burned their ties with family members, so there's no support system when they age out. And we'll be talking about reentry efforts and the challenges there. Um, many of them have addictive disorders and not been properly treated, and health and mental health afflictions that have never been properly treated. And yet we don't count them among any senses of homelessness, and we don't count them among any sense of unemployment. But realistically, if and when they transition back to the streets, they will be transitioned to chronic homelessness in short order. And that's exactly what's at stake with this generation of combat veterans and what we're all trying to prevent collectively. Um, we have been trying to amass efforts to try and intervene through the court system, identify veterans who are in, admired in our justice system and extricate them. You're going to learn a lot about those efforts today. Uh, and then we're trying proactively to work in partner with the VA and with other major groups like the ABA to marshal resources and engage our profession to respond to the, the, the broad and challenging need so we don't see this generation of combat veterans ending up having the afflictions that we saw for Vietnam and the horrific outcomes that we're now still uh, struggling to deal with. Um, so that's what's at stake. I hope that helps frame the issue. And in terms of the, the notes of hope, I think you're going to hear a lot of things here where each of us can get engaged more vigorously and more effectively and join force more powerfully towards achieving the ultimate goal of reducing homelessness for veterans and helping Secretary Shinshecki and President Obama achieve the goal of ending homelessness by 2017. Without further ado, I'd like to turn over to Suzanne Will, um, who has been one of our most dynamic partners with the VA. And she was just engaging me before the meeting to find ways that we can uh, further effectuate legal services and make them more accessible to veterans on site at the VA. These are exciting times. That was five years, it was not, literally not possible because of the concern about liability. And, um, and now we have an openness and a partnering that really is unprecedented but creates an incredible opportunity for all of us. So Suzanne, without further ado. Yes, um, um, is there somebody who's going to be changing the uh, slides? That would be the PowerPoints. <laughs> Maybe there's a remote that I could use. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Okay, well, um, my name is Suzanne Will. I've been a member of the California Bar for 33 years. Uh, the last 20 of those 33 I've worked for the Department of Veterans Affairs as an attorney. Um, I've been recently promoted from regional counsel to deputy general counsel for legal operations. And basically what that long title means is that I supervise all of the regions. So I supervise the regions which are outside the uh, Washington, D.C. Beltway. Um, we have 20 regions in um, the United States, and there are approximately 500 attorneys and paralegals in those regions. And um, we also have a central office in Washington, D.C., as most federal agencies do, and there are approximately 200 attorneys who work in uh, Washington, D.C. for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Oh, you can't hear. Okay. Is that better? Not much. Not much. Back. Is it on? Maybe I can use your Of course. Okay. Now, is this... Is this better? Okay. Um, Anyway, we have all of our clients are VA clients. We have 1,400 medical centers and outpatient clinics throughout the United States in Hawaii, Puerto Rico. We have one in Manila in the Philippines. Um, we have uh, 135 nursing homes, 232 vet centers. And um, interesting that Paul should talk about the Vietnam veterans because the vet centers were created after the Vietnam War specifically for readjustment counseling for Vietnam veterans. And they are um, 
uh, we've got over you know 230 of these vet centers all over the country. In in Hawaii, we have one vet center on every single Hawaiian island, um, and uh, the vet centers are wonderful. They provide a lot of um, psychological counseling and uh, a lot of support. Um, so uh, we are actually working with the vet centers as well as the medical centers to establish these legal clinics. We also have 57 regional offices, and these are the offices all over the country that provide veterans benefits. And then we're in charge of the National Cemetery Program. Um, if you are going out to the airport, you'll drive by the San Bruno Cemetery. Um, and that is one of our cemeteries that we take care of. So we have a lot of activities, we have a lot of clients, and we have a huge number of veterans that we take care of, many of whom are homeless. Oh, and there we are, okay. Um, you can see the top three priorities of the secretary. And today, of course, we're going to talk about the first priority, which is ending homelessness in 2015. And that is an admittedly ambitious goal, but uh, Secretary Shinseki believes that it's better to shoot high, aim high, rather than aim too low. And we're making great strides in, in doing that. So VA provides most of the um, needs that a homeless veteran has, and that would be health care, education and training, employment, shelter, uh, counseling and outreach. But what we've been finding more and more is that there's a huge unmet need of our homeless veterans and veterans, and let's face it, almost everybody, and that is a need for um, excellent legal services. What? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Who Oh, um, the, the VA has a national strategic plan, and um, uh, really our partners from all over the U.S. help us uh, determine what our goals are going to be. And usually it's, we have 10-year strategic plans and 5-year strategic plans. Oh, it's, it, it's, it's in there, but these are the top three. Yeah, yeah, there, there are a number of strategic goals. Um, so the Office of General Counsel, who I work for, um, uh, has basically the attorneys in the Office of General Counsel cannot provide legal advice, personal legal advice to veterans. When we get calls from veterans in the past, we've had to refer them to their local uh, county bar associations or other nonprofit agencies for help. Um, but because we cannot give them direct legal advice. It would be outside the scope of our employment. So we, oh, thank you, thank you. So we decided we had to do something different. Um, in 1994, VA created a program. Um, it's an acronym that basically, it's CHALLENGE. And you can see community homelessness assessment and so on and so forth. Uh, VA decided that it wanted to have a plan to end homelessness. And this was way back in 1994. <clears throat> but knew that it could not do that without a collaboration of local and state government and most importantly, nonprofit organizations. And so uh, collaboration was created and it was called Challenge. In 2011, Challenge <clears throat> did a survey to determine what are the top unmet legal needs of the homeless vet. 
and you can see eviction and foreclosure. That seems logical. Um, also, child support issues. Um, we have uh, an increasing number of women veterans after the Desert Storm um, Wars, and uh, many of the women veterans find themselves, as well as men, that they have they need a divorce, they can't afford it. Their um, whoever, whichever spouse is not supporting the children is not doing so. So the domestic law area is a big need. Also, restoring driver's licenses, you know, just simple DMV issues, because if you don't have a driver's license, you're not mobile, you can't find work, you can't uh, sustain a job uh, easily. And then finally, in the criminal realm, outstanding warrants and fines, expungements um, of uh, petty crimes, drug charges. Um, if if they can't if they can't um, get control of those issues, they will have to admit on their applications for jobs that they have a criminal background. So they also need some criminal help. So we have, uh, we know that legal representation is instrumental. We have veteran service officers who um, are sponsored by vet organizations such as the American Legion, Disabled Vets of America, and they can only do so much. They are usually well, they're veterans, of course, but they're lay people who are not trained in legal matters. And it's absolutely essential that we have committed lawyers who are willing to provide pro bono services or work for nonprofit legal s groups to, um, to help provide those services to veterans. Um, Every region in the Office of General Counsel and the Department of Veterans Affairs has a Veterans Justice Outreach Specialist Liaison. In, in our region, it's Janice Bressler who works tire, tirelessly with the VJOs and the medical centers and the nonprofits to set up these legal clinics. Janice, you want to raise your hand? There, there's Janice. Uh, the VA has 247 VJO specialists, that's Veterans Justice Outreach Specialists, and Dr. Rosenthal will be telling you a little bit more about what they do. Um, right now, this, this slide was created in February of 2014 when at that time we had 47 different organizations in 44 VA facilities um, throughout the country providing pro bono le legal services. Today we have 54, two months later, we have 54 different organizations in 52 VA facilities. So you can see how the legal clinics are growing very nicely. So today, I'd like to tell you how VA, VA working collaboratively is trying to bridge the gap to provide access to legal services for our homeless veterans. What I'd like to do is focus on the state of California because California has the largest homeless population. California is warmer than most. Um, it's a huge state, uh, it's more liberal, people are more accepting of homeless people. Um, what, I don't know if that's good, but um, uh, you know, there's many reasons why California has the largest homeless population, both veteran and non-veteran. Uh, so how do we reach out to those veterans who need the legal services? Um, right here, I've got two, um, posters. We post them all over our medical centers and our vet centers. And, you know, the, the, the top 
line in bold print is free clinics for veterans, free legal clinics for veterans. And veterans see these and they write down the day that the clinic will be at that medical center or that vet center and they show up. Uh, these clinics are extremely robust. Janice can tell you and I've visited some of them as well. Um, there are veterans who are standing outside the door waiting to have their turn. We have both appointments and walk-ins, um, so people will arrange their appointments so they can come to these legal clinics. Uh, they're very popular and uh, there's a lot of participation. What I'd like to do is to tell you about, uh, specifically about some of the really exciting legal clinics that are going on right now in the Bay Area and um, uh, in Southern California. Um, if you've ever been to 3rd and Harrison in San Francisco, you will know that, the, that VA has a downtown clinic there. It was strategically placed because so many veterans, homeless veterans, congregate in that area. Uh, we have a, a, a wonderful pro bono clinic there that is staffed by Swords to Plowshares. Um, this organization is a veterans organization and they have attorneys that staff the legal clinics there. Um, they focus on expungements, um, usually drug convictions, other petty crimes, and discharge upgrades. Um, now you've probably heard that there's an honorable discharge and there's a dishonorable discharge, but there's a gray area in between that's called less than honorable discharge. What we've been finding is that many veterans have a less than honorable discharge uh, due to acting out in some way, not bad enough to have a dishonorable discharge, but bad enough to get a less than honorable discharge. And now we're finding that many of these veterans have acted out due to undiagnosed PTSD or traumatic brain injury. And these are the people that need the, the health care services from VA more than anybody. Um, so we need advocates who are willing to, there's a, a due process appeal, to go in and file the appeal papers and advocate for that veteran. Uh, once the veteran has an upgrade in his or her discharge status, then they can get the medical care that they desperately need, as well as benefits for service-connected disabilities. So that's a very important um, area of, of uh, advocacy. We have a number of law schools, top law schools actually, all across the country who are participating in legal clinics. And the really wonderful thing about the law students who are working in these legal clinics is that many of them are veterans themselves. They've come back from Desert Storm, they're um, Afghani or Iraqi veterans. They're going to law school on the GI Bill and they um, have a strong desire to help other veterans with their legal needs. So that is very exciting. Uh, the University of California Berkeley Bolt Hall is conducting one of the clinics at the San Francisco Medical Center out uh, at Land's End in uh, San Francisco. And they operate every Friday. Um, they, do an they do a variety of intake um, uh, civil matters. Uh, usually they help with benefits and discharge upgrades. Um, Berkeley uh, School of Law has also started a legal clinic at the uh, Oakland Vet Center, which is nice because it's closer to Berkeley. And again, these are both very popular clinics. Uh, we're currently talking with Stanford Law School, which is very interested in staffing a free clinic for veterans at the Redwood 
vet center in Redwood City, which is down the peninsula from San Francisco. Uh, we have a very unique legal clinic in our Santa Rosa, which is north of San Francisco, our Santa Rosa outpatient clinic. And it's staffed by an experienced criminal defense attorney who is also a veteran and, again, has a strong desire to help other veterans. His work focuses on criminal law issues, uh, such as expungements, outstanding warrants, and fines. Uh, many uh, veterans um, and homeless veterans are paralyzed by these legal issues hanging over their head and they need to get resolution on those matters. Um, the, uh, the attorney in Santa Rosa, and actually his poster is one of the two up here, so you can take a look at it. Um, he uh, has face-to-face -face meetings with veterans, but he's also willing to talk by phone to a veteran who can't get to Santa Rosa. So uh, he's a very um, caring and dynamic uh, part of the team. Um, the San Francisco Bar Association receives, um, is very deserving of kudos because they are planning a one-day free legal clinic. Um, it's Justice and Diversity Group is, is planning this um, on, on planning for incapacity. Um, one of the biggest problems we have in the VA is that we will have um, a veteran who's incapacitated, cannot make his or her own decisions about medical care or where to go next. And when his medical treatment is completed and he's well enough to be discharged but still needs to have some rehabilitation or other care in a nursing home, if that incapacitated veteran does not have a surrogate, private nursing homes will not accept that veteran as a patient. Now, VA has nursing homes, but they're very limited and there's a list of priorities such as you have to be 100% service connected, you have to be a, a, a Purple Heart recipient. And so many uh, homeless veterans uh, do not make the cut for VA nursing homes and need to be put in private nursing homes. VA contracts with excellent private nursing homes and pays for them. But if the, if the patient, if the veteran does not have a surrogate who can make these decisions, the private nursing home will not take the patient. And so then they languish in a hospital bed for a while because we're not going to put anybody out on the street. And, um, and, and they take up a bed that is needed by a patient that truly needs that bed. So it's a problem. And, and to have a, a clinic, which will be widely publicized, that helps the veteran prepare for incapacity, either through an advanced directive or um, some other legal document, uh, even a conservatorship, uh, that would be of great value. So. Thank you very much, San Francisco Bar Association, for that. Um, in Los Angeles, we have a uh, free legal clinic that is a medical legal partnership, and um, it's, it's a collaboration between an inner city, the inner city law center and the doctors in the homeless primary care unit. There are so many homeless veterans in Los Angeles especially near the 405 freeway and the um, uh, Brentwood, Westwood area, that the, the largest medical center in VA, which is the Los Angeles Medical Center, actually has a separate primary care unit for homeless veterans. That's how many there are. And they work collaboratively to deal with problems of the, uh, the patients. We have other uh, vet centers in uh, clinics in vet centers in Garden Grove and Mission Viejo in Southern California. 
Equal Justice Works um, is funded by AmeriCorps legal fellows to work in those vet centers. We're talking to D.L. Piper, which is a huge bankruptcy uh, law firm all over the country, to provide bankruptcy help to our veterans. And they've already established um, a number of clinics in New York and other places. We want one in San Francisco. And the law firm of Hansen and Bridget in San Francisco has contacted us and they want to undertake a pro bono clinic. So that gives you a flavor of some of the things that we're doing in California. We've got more plans, more ideas, and if you've got ideas, please let Janice and I know. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And I'm turning over to my friend Joel Rosenthal to discuss his work at the VA in terms of homelessness and justice of all veterans. Go ahead, Joel. Oh, thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning. And uh, I want to start by um, really linking to uh, a piece that, that Paul highlighted, uh, and that is, you know, as I heard it, it was three H's. So it was the, the notion of the helplessness uh, that we often see with, with, and I'll speak about homeless veterans, but obviously among the homelessness more generally, uh, the, the really the critical importance of, of humanizing um, the homeless and uh, and that as a way f to instill hope among them and among us to be able to to really be able to do something on their behalves. Um, I, I also you know, want to uh, just acknowledge you, Paul, and any other veterans in the room for your service. Um, uh, that is, you know, so dear and so important to all of us. Um, uh, I am a, a clinical psychologist by training and uh, have been with the Department of Veterans Affairs now uh, going on 30 years, a little less than 30 years. Uh, the first uh, almost 24 years of that time was uh, as a staff psychologist with uh, VA Palo Alto and uh, in various roles uh, culminating in the last 13 years of that I was the uh, coordinator of clinical services for our domiciliary which is a hundred bed uh, facility on the Menlo Park campus uh, for uh, where we have there's a residential program for homeless veterans and for uh, uh, addiction treatment. Uh, in the last about four years uh, I've been employed by our VA central office in Washington and I'm, I'm in the role of the national training director for what is called the veterans justice programs and that is the umbrella program that oversees two initiatives Healthcare for Reentry Veterans, which is our work with uh, all veterans in, in state and federal prison throughout the country, and then Veterans Justice Outreach, uh, which is a, a newer initiative um, where we are focused on work with veterans who are incarcerated in the jail facilities, who are involved with the court system, and who uh, are in contact with law enforcement. So I, I really, the opportunity to be here and provide a, a clinician's perspective, a, a VA perspective uh, is, is, is so appreciated. Um, the, you know, Su Suzanne spoke about uh, the, the, the number one priority uh, initiative in the VA being to end homelessness, and it's literally to end homelessness. That is Secretary Shinseki's desire. Um, and, and actually the, the numbers for the VA are actually even slightly better than, than what was quoted. Um, what, what happens each year is there is something called a point in time count, which is done at the beginning of the year. And so the, the uh, report from January of 2013 uh, came out in January of 2014, and, and the pit count um, at that time was uh, 57,849 veterans homeless on that given night. Uh, in January of 2013, and that, that actually represents uh, a 24 percent decrease in veteran homelessness uh, since 2009 when this initiative, uh, when this priority was established by uh, President Obama and Secretary Shinseki. Um, the, the approach that the VA has taken uh, is, is really three-pronged. There's been an evolution in, in the nature and the way uh, services and the way that we go about doing this that has evolved to what is 
uh, called Housing First, and, and the idea there, of course, is to provide housing as the first and foremost piece, and from that, then the idea is that you then positioned individuals to be to to be better able to take advantage and receive all the other necessary uh, associated services. Uh, the second part of the approach uh, Suzanne already spoke about, which is the, the extreme partnership and everything that I talk about, I'm uh, presenting uh, later today as well. Anything I talk about um, is a reflection of our partnership. Uh, so there may be things that we're doing directly in the VA, many things that we're doing directly in the VA, none of which is accomplished without the, the collaboration with our, our community and our justice partners. And, and the third piece in terms of our overall approach is the recognition that, that poverty is, is the most significantly correlated uh, component with homelessness. And so uh, with that in mind, um, one of the things that we really aimed at is, is affordable housing and then emphasis on uh, financial support, you know, if at all possible through employment and vocational training. Um, as we have, as the, the years are winding down towards that five-year point, um, the pressure is on. Uh, we're, st you know, uh, January 2013, we were still at 57,000 plus. And so um, that has, that has uh, forced the VA, and I'm saying forced in a positive way, has forced us to look at how do you start to, you know, get further down. Anybody who's a golfer who knows that, knows that if you, as you get better, it's harder and harder to lower your handicap. And, and I would say the same thing about ending homelessness is now we are really dealing with the folks that are, are the most difficult to, to help um, bring out of homelessness um, and, and including many who really prefer that as a lifestyle, which is an interesting conceptual and, and philosophical issue that I would think would probably get some airtime today. Um, in, uh, so one of the things that we've done as we have looked at that hard to reach population is uh, we've, we've developed a system of gap analysis where we've really looked at where the, where the pockets uh, remain of, of the most noteworthy homelessness among veterans and part of a 25 city project that are key large cities that are really being targeted to, to try to bring the number down literally to zero by the end of, of, of uh, 2015. Um, the the prime uh, driver of services to the homeless in the VA is the Office of, of Homeless Programs, and um, that is where our office, the Veterans Justice Program, resides. So we've been part of the, the Office of Homeless Programs since our inception in 2007. And that is because we are really we are very wedded to the to the homeless programs by history, and the other piece of that is that we are seen as a central piece in the prevention of homelessness in the work that we do with justice involved veterans. In the Office of Homeless Programs, there's there's several several um, domains to think about the work that we do. So I'll, I'll kind of start from you know what we do out in front first, and then and then kind of move from there. And and so out front is our outreach and linking veterans to services. And uh, we do we do extensive outreach, uh, street outreach, which we've been doing for many many years. The the uh, VA started its residential programs for homeless. Uh, homelessness in our domiciliaries in 1988 and with that was a, a strong expectation of any program that received money to open up the residential program is that they would do active street outreach which the VA is still uh, doing um, uh, to, uh, to at great lengths. Um, in addition to that, with the inception of our programs in 2007, um, we are now doing extensive outreach to the prisons and jails, which I'll talk about uh, later. And, um, and then we have also established sites and clinics in, in the VA that are walk-in locations for veterans um, to, to come in and get guidance around how to, to address issues of homelessness and anything related to that. Um, finally, in terms of our kind of outreach to veterans, we have established a national uh, call center. Um, I'll give you that number. That number is 877-4-AID-VET, 877-4-AID-VET. That is our national call center. Um, 2013, there was some, about 110,000 calls to that 24-hour number um, that were linked to veterans. 
And with that, there is a, an extensive system in the VA to take those calls and then make a, a referral and a consult back to the home uh, medical center uh, that is closest to where that um, veteran resides or is, or is homeless. Um, so then after outreach and linkage, we have uh, extensive housing programs. And in my presentation this afternoon, I'm going to focus a little bit more on specific services. So I'll just mention again from kind of a broad brush of approach kind of how we're looking at things and in housing we have programs both in the way of permanent housing, uh, transitional housing up to two years, uh, and then contract and emergency housing. Um, again, all with local uh, partners. Uh, we also, the, the VA, um, one of the beauties of working in the VA system as a clinician and, uh, and now as a bureaucrat uh, is that uh, we have an, an extensive continuum of, of, of care and treatment services. Uh, I'm not sure matched anywhere in any single healthcare system, um, potentially in the world. And so, um, in addition to very specific programs for homelessness, we also, of course, have, uh, in response to you know the question about um, uh, mental health and addiction services, you know, very extensive uh, treatment uh, programs for those kinds of services, as well as specialty services such as as trauma-related issues, uh, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury. Um, and, and of course, medical services, which oftentimes is the is the inroad to the VA. Um, a lot of times, veterans may not be inclined to come to the VA for mental health, addiction treatment, uh, you know, uh, because of stigma, because of issues around resistance or denial, whatever it may be. But we can always say to them, well, you know, are you, you know, are you getting good medical care? And th those 80% of those who served in the military who are eligible for VA services, if we can get them in the door and get them starting to receive medical services, um, oftentimes that then it becomes the, the vehicle to, to linking them to, to other services over time. Uh, a, uh, a fourth area is really overlaps with what Suzanne uh, talked about, and that is kind of other ancillary services. And really, the, the two primary examples that I was going to indicate for that is child support and, and legal services. And so that I think has been addressed. Um, the and, we, and I was also going to talk about our planning process challenge, as was highlighted. Um, one of the things that happens is, uh, in terms of challenge, is that every local community where there is a VA is expected at the initiation of the VA to do a an annual. Now it's an annual homeless summit that is driven by the challenge uh, program, where community and VA partners and veterans and families are brought together to get input that goes into those those identified needs that were, were up on the up there that that is where that comes from. The number one need, which obviously wasn't up there, um, that has been consistent for the past two or three years. Anybody want to take a guess at what the number one need is identified by partners and veterans and families uh, in terms of, of homeless needs of, of veterans? I'm sorry? Housing. Housing. Uh, you're warm. Go a little more specific. Uh, keep going. Think subpopulation. Think criminal justice system. Uh, think a subpopulation of the incarcerated veteran population. Veterans with sex offense histories. So housing for veterans with sex offense histories has, has been the top of the list the last at least two, if not three, three years. Um, lastly, we have extensive services in the way of prevention, and uh, so we have programs that are that are um, spoken of as rapid housing, uh, rapid rehousing, and prevention. Uh, we have a program called Supportive Services for Veterans and Families, where there's actually grant money that is allocated to community partners who can then provide money um, to get veterans and families back into housing quickly if they have lost housing uh, and or to, to help families who are at the risk of, of losing their housing. Um, in addition to that, um, there is a, a recently developed program for specifically for our recently discharging veterans to try to as a, as a preventive measure around homelessness and homelessness risk. And then as I mentioned, our veterans justice programs are thought of as, as prevention. So um, what I'd like to do now is, um, is I have a, a very short video. Um, it is uh, four minutes in length, 
And um, uh, so about three years ago, um, we developed a program video for our veterans justice programs that cuts across everything that we do. And that video is, is 22 plus minutes long. Um, we asked Secretary Shinseki to, to be part of that video and he graciously agreed to do so. And so he actually kicks off the 22 minute video with a, a four minute piece, um, it, which is his way of talking about um, our approach to justice involved veterans in the VA. And then it concludes with a, about a 30 second piece from my recently retired boss, Jim McGuire, which is an invitation to veterans and families to take advantage of our veterans justice program services. So I'd like to show that now. Here at the Department of Veterans Affairs, one of our top three priorities is ending veterans' homelessness. A major cause of veterans' homelessness is what happens to veterans who become involved with our justice system. Assisting justice-involved veterans is crucial to ending veterans' homelessness. For years now, I've tried to reconcile two disparate images of veterans. The first image is the more familiar one for most Americans. Each year, roughly 60% of high school graduates in this country go on to some form of higher education. Much of the remaining 40% or so undergo vocational training or enter the workforce directly. Fewer others join the less than 1% of Americans who volunteer to safeguard our nation through service in uniform. After enlisting, these young volunteers undergo weeks of tough training to prepare them for a disciplined life of values, standards, and accountability. Upon arrival at their first units, they quickly become trusted members of high-performing teams, tough, well-led, highly disciplined, and extremely motivated. They go forward every day to perform complex, difficult, and dangerous missions, all without fanfare or complaint. As a group, they are simply outstanding young people, among the best this country has to offer. This is their collective narrative. But there is a second image, a smaller group of veterans who enter a downward spiral that often includes depression, among other mental health issues such as PTSD and TBI, substance abuse, failed relationships, joblessness, which can descend into homelessness and sometimes suicide. There is no difference in how these two groups started out, but how they finish is starkly different. So this is not about them. This is about us. Tens of thousands of veterans are released from prison each year, and thousands more enter into or end up being supervised by the justice system. If we are to end veterans' homelessness, we must disrupt the cycles that have come to dominate the lives of justice-involved veterans. To ensure they have the best chance to succeed, our department is intent on identifying and assisting them. This includes ensuring that those who are eligible have full access to the broad range of benefits and services they have earned, including are several residential treatment programs. We want to evoke the discipline, pride, and camaraderie that they learned and lived in uniform to rebuild their futures. VA cannot do this alone. Our partners throughout the justice system, community providers, and fellow veterans who have skills, knowledge, and attributes to affect rescues can and must help. Service members have lived a code that promised never to leave a fallen comrade. So today I seek your assistance, your collaboration, your counsel, and your support in a cooperative effort to ensure we never leave behind justice-involved veterans who have the potential to change their futures. If you are a veteran or a family member of a veteran needing services, there is a specialist at each of the VA medical centers to assist you. We welcome you to contact us through our websites 
or through justice system professionals that you may be working with. Thank you. So I'll, I'll finish up quickly so we have time for discussion. Um, one thing, we, uh, when we developed the 22-minute the video, um, uh, and, and we're so pleased that Secretary Shinseki was willing to uh, be on it. You know, what we're accustomed to is when we ask somebody at, at any high level, and certainly at his level, to do something, that we provide the material to them. And so we attempted to do that, and we were quickly told by his office staff, that is not necessary, we're not interested in what you guys have to write. Secretary Shinseki is very clear about what he wants to say. So this, this is really his, his words and his, and his approach. And the, the question about who established the priorities, um, we would not be doing what we are doing if it was not for Secretary Shinseki's dedication to, to homeless veterans and to mental health and addiction. I mean, it, it, uh, having been in the VA 30 years, I can tell you that um, you, you see the commitment of leadership by the way it plays out um, in what comes down to the medical center in the way of resources, and the, the resources have been absolutely unbelievable. Um, to the point that we added, in times as the budgets are shrinking, we just added 75 new uh, Veterans Justice Outreach Specialist positions. The other thing I would just say as follow-up to the to the video is that of everything that Secretary Shinseki says, the, the one that really caught me the first time I heard it and every time I hear it is, is his statement is, this is not about them, this is about us. Um, that really it's, it's on us, not, at, not divorcing those veterans from their responsibility to be part of their own solution, but that we really have to work together to, be, be, to help them with the solution. So with that, I, I really I don't want to take much more time. I do have some more air time this afternoon. Um, you know, this is really the lead into talking about the Veterans Justice Programs, which I mentioned before, are the two initiatives. And, um, and our initiatives, when they got started, they really formalized efforts that were going on in the VA previously, grassroots efforts that were where veterans from the Vietnam era were going into prisons and doing outreach and finding veterans, and where the vet centers were going in and doing work in the prisons that, that wasn't happening in other places in the VA. It got formalized with our programs. Um, uh, HCRV, prison, uh, the prison-based outreach to all the state and federal prisons. We have a physical presence in 998 of the 1,200 plus prisons around the country, and that is accomplished by 44 veterans reentry specialists um, uh, spread around our 21 visits throughout the country, which to me is a very impressive, it's very impressive on the part of, of those individuals that they, are, they have that level of coverage of the prisons. Um, and basically what they're doing is they're going in identifying veterans, um, helping them to determine if they're eligible for VA services. If they're not, are there things that they might be able to do around uh, discharge upgrade, as was discussed. Um, and then helping them to start thinking about reentry planning and linking to VA services if they're eligible for VA services and, and or community services. Because what we, again, what we know is that VA services don't cover everything or even if we have those services, there are always capacity issues. And so we're, it's very much linking them to both VA and community services. Um, and we have served 50, 57,000 veterans uh, who were incarcerated in state and federal prisons since 2007 when we started this. Veterans Justice Outreach is the more visible of our programs, and that's the program, as I mentioned before, that includes work with doing similar outreach as we do in the prisons, but to the local county jails. Um, and, and then also our linkage with the courts, and especially with the collaborative treatment courts and the veterans treatment courts, which now is uh, closing in on almost 300 around the country, and we have a physical presence in every single one of those courts by one of our VJO specialists. Uh, and then our work with law enforcement, and one of our big initiatives um, that we have going is we, we have partnered with the Office of Mental Health in the VA and with the Law Enforcement Training Center, which is VA's uh, branch of training all of our police officers. We have 3,200 uh, police officers in the VA spread around our 152 medical centers, most all of whom of those officers are veterans, uh, over 90% of them. And so we have a training initiative that we are about two-thirds of the way through um, in, uh, in training those officers to be better uh, uh, understanding of mental health and behavioral issues, how to link those veterans to the needed services, and how for uh, officers and other VA providers to work closely together. So with that, I will, I will end so we have a little time for discussion. Thank you very much, Joel. It gave us a wonderful flavor of how 
dynamic and proactive the VA has been doing in welcoming community partnerships and taking the initiative to reach out to groups like the ABA and really make a difference. The, the veteran treatment courts in particular, we've discovered is that they've played a major role in helping educate the judiciary on the power of the collaborative therapeutic restorative justice model. Um, three years ago, there were only two veterans courts in the entire country. They're now close to 300, thanks to leadership by the ABA, the VA, uh, the National Council on, on Drug, uh, Associated Drug Court Professionals, which are having a, a, a big summit in Orange County at the end of May on, to promote the Veteran Treatment Court. If any of you are interested, I'd be happy with, to share with you about that as well. I do want to mention one thing from the film that was very noteworthy was uh, you saw Stephen Manley, the one judge that was indicated. He'll be here later. Uh, he's truly a national treasure, in my view. Uh, on the issue of sex offenders and housing, he single-handedly tackled that issue by going out to faith communities and saying, I can't preach from a sermon, but I can do a public service announcement. And engaged faith communities as a result, I think it's probably a far more significant figure now, but he created 40 permanent supportive housing units for sex offenders on his special needs docket as a result of that outreach on his own time on Sundays. Uh, another example of ways that we can be uh, more pro proactive and dynamic. We do have a couple minutes for questions, so I'm just curious if anyone in the audience would like to Five minutes? All right, we have five minutes for questions. Yes, over here. Can you speak up? Uh, Probably access to benefits. Um, I don't remember. I can find out for you. I think oh, it's I mean, probably yeah. the, the benefits claim backlog. Yes, sir. The process for um, say again. For in the film, it talks about the property of the department is intent on identifying criminal justice involved in How does a particular county do that? Got it. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll answer that actually with two pieces what we have done historically and then what we have now been able to add. So historically, um, we would, uh, our Veterans Justice Outreach Specialists would, would make contact with the, the jails and uh, the larger jails typically and, and try to make arrangements to be able to come in and do regular outreach, maybe monthly, uh, some weekly down in LA. I think they do, week, uh, actually I think they're in daily in, in LA, but varying lengths of time. And, and then work with a, a contact person within the jail to um, uh, and to identify veterans, which up to this point has been by self-report of the veterans, and so, and we've pushed the systems to have at least on their screening information a way for somebody to indicate that they were in military service, and then we would try to follow up with them and and see if they needed our assistance. Um, the the piece that has been added is something that's called Veterans Reentry Search Service, and that is actually a computer match between all of the the um, uh, everybody who has ever served in the military. Um, we have that database that we own at, and so what we've done is we've set up a system now that any com uh, justice partner that would like to work with us on this can actually uh, do a, a, a data load of their population. A uh, jail can do that, a court can do it, uh, prisons can do that, and it will, it will provide back a listing of everybody who is in that system that has a, a record of military history, not, so not by self-report, but by, by the actual records. We currently have 31 partners around the country that have taken advantage of that. It's, it's new. It's, it's very new. Mm -hmm. uh, you could start with me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. It's over here. Right. Less than honorable. Less than dishonorable. So I'm wondering if you know. <laughs> Other than honorable. <laughs> Joel? 
Sure. Uh, so I, I mentioned before that uh, of those who served in the military, um, that uh, about 80 percent are eligible for VA services. So that basically is the figure in general terms of those who have a, a, either a, a, a discharge under honorable or general conditions, uh, which allows you to be eligible for VA services. <laughs> Somebody who has an other than honorable discharge but is service connected for some sort of disability still is eligible to get VA services for, for whatever is related to that malady, but not more generally. Of the other 20 percent, I do not know the breakdown between um, uh, dishonorable and other than honorable. I, I'm just not sure about that. That's another piece we could try to get. Um, but um, in terms of uh, resources, um, VA services to those who are eligible. There are a couple of VA programs through contractors that uh, other than honorable are eligible for as well, a couple of our housing projects. And, um, and then again, we work to link people to community services who are not eligible. And that's another area where the ABA is working proactively with the VA to have discharge upgrades uh, efforts. For example, with respect to service members who are functionally discharged because they were gay, out of the change in the law now, they qualify for discharge upgrades, and that's that's a huge initiative that we're trying to mobilize. I think in the back was first. It's a priority because we'd rather have people housed and know where they are if they're sex offenders than have them on the streets where we don't know where they are. I think. That's that's one simple answer. Do you have other? Well, I would just clarify. It's um, it is not. There there was two things shown. There was the the priorities of the VA with ending homelessness being the number one priority, access to services being the third one, the benefits piece being in between those two, and then there was the identification of the unmet needs from the challenge survey that is done every year. So if I wasn't clear about it, I apologize. The number one unmet need, as identified by providers and veterans and families is housing for those with sex offense histories, not the number one priority in terms of the VA's mission. And, mm -hmm. and there's, there's also Megan's Law, I believe it's Megan's Law, and uh, you know, sex offenders cannot live uh, within a certain distance of a school, uh, elementary school or middle school, is that correct? Uh, yeah. And that, because I know it's come up, we, we were thinking of having housing um, at the uh, LA VAMC and converting an old building into to veterans housing and um, we did talk about the fact that the Brentwood school was really close by and you know whether that would violate Megan's law or not. So we, with that issue, you know, we're in the same boat as everybody out there, which is it's the, probably the most difficult, the re, one of the reasons it's the number one in my need is because it is so difficult to, to come up with solutions. Okay, we have one, time for one more, last question. Sorry to interrupt. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, we're actually working with the DMV to help that identification on the driver's license, but also working with the with the. Where are you from? Oregon. In LA, at least, we're working more practically. The sheriff's department is capturing whether or not you served in the military. We're also working at the the front end to try and divert individuals at the point of arrest into treatment and VA options and that's something that's been we've had some really great uh, cooperation with the VA. Yeah so I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards when we go out and we encourage systems to ask that question what we're the ideal thing that we're encouraging is that that system that that happens starting at that point of con at every point of contact including law enforcement and that it be an integrated system so if the law enforcement are the ones that identify it, it goes into the same system as the jail identifying it we're out of time there'll be plenty of time during lunch to ask these kind of questions i want you to think proactively about which group your question is most likely to be responded to and and take advantage of that opportunity and now it's time to turn on to our next program